Hello, hello. Yeah, hello. Hello. Nice meeting you. So, what is your name and what makes you hopeful for the future? Yes, so my name is Mercedes, like the car, Lopez Morales. Uh, I'm originally from Spain uh, and I'm an astrophysicist uh, at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So I'm actually a Smithsonian employee, but we're in Boston. Full disclosure. So, yes. Uh, so you're on the clock right now. You're the only, you, okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I actually get the backhander after a while. <laughs> like, you know, if I say good things, so it's Smithsonian. Um, so uh, what makes me optimistic about life is, you know, part of it is geeky, part of it is human. Uh, the geeky part is, uh, you know, I work on exoplanets, uh, which are planets that go around the stars that are near the sun. And over the past 25 years, 23, uh, we have been looking for other planets like Earth. And uh, at the beginning, we were finding things like Jupiter, uh, Saturn, which are like these big, massive balls of gas where, you know, if you try to step on them, they just sink to the bottom. And, um, you know, our technology was at that point where that was the only things that we could detect. And uh, over the past nine years, uh, our techniques have improved so much that we are now at the point that we can detect planets the same size as Earth. Um, there's still quite a bit of work to do, um, but I basically go around saying that we are going to be the first generation that is going to find planets like Earth. And um, so I'm pretty optimistic about that. Um, the part that is a more social um, about it is that, uh, you know, exoplanets is a field that is very attractive to the public. Um, when we all were kids, you know, like you were five or six or seven, they would tell you the stories about other planets and with little aliens on them, and we were all excited. And then, you know, then you grow up, you figure out that you have to make money, support your family, <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's just stories. And so you sort of lose that little bit of excitement when, when you're actually a kid. Um, so, so as scientists, like serious scientists, we can bring that excitement back. And it's not only to kids, but to adults. And um, so as a result, we're actually seeing a lot of engagement of younger people, like down to like 10 year olds that they want to be astronomers and they want to be astronomers because they want to look for planets. So somehow we are managing to involve the younger people and you know, attract them into science just because the topic that we are working on is something that they feel is tangible, you know, that they can, they can reach that. Uh, so that makes me optimistic that you know, like the younger generations are getting more involved in the science. So itself. the technology is begatted an ability to gather new information, which creates new curiosities, which then fuels. Yeah, I mean, somehow the curiosity has been always there. Um, but there, there has been this disconnect between, you know, who a scientist is. And like, the, the view of a scientist is very disconnected from the view of the average person. Like, when I was a kid, you know, I grew up in the Canary Islands in Spain. And, you know, we have palm trees and coconuts. We have a big volcano. We have British tourists that come in. You know, I did not see myself as an astronomer, but I like math. You know, I was obsessed with numbers. I mean, that was my thing. And then, you know, it's, it so happened that we had telescopes there. So, and that's how I became a physicist first and then an astronomer. So, so, so astronomer brings that. To, to, to the little kids, you know, that they, that they actually see, oh, you know, it's like, that's so cool. You know, there's planets around other stars. There might be some of them that are like Earth, and that woman looks like me, you know, especially for the little girls that are short like me. I mean, that's, <laughs> man, I can tell you, all the female graduate students that are short are working with me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's awesome. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that makes me so happy. You know, it it's seems like, that there is somewhere in what you do, I don't think that different from a lot of other careers in the sense of there being some sort of, would I be fair in saying that there's a rush from this, yeah. from the discovery, from yeah. finding the information, like some degree of adrenaline. Is there, a, is there ever a fear of what you may discover? Yeah, I mean, um, 
you know, I talk a lot with people about this because, you know, I'm in the bus going to work and people ask me what I do and then the, the conversation begins, right? And um, I noticed that there is a little bit of a fear that we are going to discover a civilization that is going to kill us, it's going to attack us, but... To be fair, Avengers has us all concerned. <laughs> <laughs> but this is like, we're not looking for that, we're looking for knowledge. And knowledge to me brings peace of mind and yeah, I, yeah I, I'm trying to say sanity, but it's not sanity. It brings like, it brings you down to earth and it makes you more conscious of what you have and what you, what you don't have. You know, and my conversations with people always go down the road of, what if there is no other planet like Earth? <coughs> you know, and then my answer is that, well, then you better take care of this one, you know, and you better don't start fighting each other. What if there is many planets like Earth? Well, so then we are not so special, you know, then we have to stop fighting each other. So, so, so I love it because, you know, we do like serious research. I mean, it's not like we are just chatting among each other. It's like, like our research is pretty serious stuff, but then you can connect it to society just like that. And, you know, that brings a lot of hope for people in a sense and a lot of like deep thought of who we are and where are we going, what are we doing to each other, you know, whether we like people in the south or not, you know, it's like there shouldn't be a south and a north. Maybe there is humans against Martians, you know, it's like, you know, it has to come down to that at some point. It's very interesting. I, and I asked, and I know you can't necessarily speak for everyone that shares your j job title and your career field, but when you talk to a layman and you're kind of going back and forth a little bit about this, do you ever feel a degree of, I don't want to say underappreciation because what you do is very important, yeah. but do you ever feel like it goes over someone's head and they just don't understand how yeah. significant this work is to the continuance of the species? Well, so this is the thing, like scientists talk like they're the center of the universe, you know, and <laughs> what we do is the most important thing in the world. And that's not the case, you know. What we are doing is we are contributing to knowledge, like everybody else. And, you know, we are just curious about things. And we decide to choose that path because that's what calls us, you know. It's like, what is out there in the universe, you know? Like, do we understand how things work? I mean, that's, that's the human curiosity. Um, so in that sense, Scientists come from the, this point of view that people have to look at me like I'm super cool and super, super smart, and that bothers me because it makes me feel disconnected from society. And so I always try to bring it back, you know, and say, well, you know, this is actually like, like anybody can do this. You know, you just need to like math a little bit. You need, you, you need to study physics. You need to know a little bit, you know, a little bit about computer coding, and you can do it. And, um, you know, that seems, to, that seems to catch with people, like the fact that they have a scientist, which, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm the geekiest person in the world. I mean, I'm, I am a geek. But if I want people to get engaged with what I do, I have to step down from my geeky, you, you know, like stool, because otherwise it doesn't get across. Because sometimes so, geekiness is perceived as arrogance. Yeah, a lot of the time. I mean, you probably agree that it's like, well, it depends on how you say the stats. Like, you go, well, did you know, actually, I don't know. Oh, I can be, be like, super arrogant. Who's I mean, this person? If you I know all me. the planets. I still <laughs> count Pluto as a planet. Like, yeah, I'll yeah. get defensive. Yeah, yeah. So, would you say, and I know this is kind of, this is kind of off center, off the topic, but would that drive some of the climate change argument in this country? Do you think that's maybe part of the problem? Is the that arrogance? the people who give the information aren't necessarily coming down yeah. to speak eye to eye with the people who they think don't believe the data. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem is, um, you know, we as scientists, I think that we have the responsibility of bringing our knowledge to people. Like, not everybody can be a scientist, but a lot of people can understand the scientific concepts. You know, if, if you as a scientist are able to explain, you know, the concepts, removing all the equations, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so, so it is our responsibility to bring it to the people and say, look, this is what is happening. You know, I'm not going to explain to you, you know, x squared plus y equals gamma over 2. Right? Exactly. But then... I know the space shuttle has to go like 50,000 miles an hour <laughs> there you go. escape velocity. I know that. See? I learned yeah, that. Yeah, escape velocity is gravity. But, uh, but this is the thing, right? Because somebody 
told it to you in terms that you could understand, right? Yes. And you get it. So I think it's our responsibility as scientists to explain things to people in a logical way. And you know, in a way that doesn't sound arrogant. And you know, in a way that people feel connected and that people feel that scientists are people. Which I think is happening anyhow. But mm -hmm. you know, I think that's the path. And I'm actually, again, quite optimistic about it because I think the younger generations of scientists are getting it. Like most younger scientists are more like me than people that are older than me. I mean, they get it, that they have to communicate their science, they have to communicate their knowledge. So. Um, well, I guess I'll end with this question. What do you, which would you, which do you prioritize more? If you could have one, better research or the general public having a better understanding and appreciation of your research? Yeah, I think, I think that you need a combination of both. Because, um, no, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm not taking the middle ground, but you know, if I come here in 10 years and I'm telling you the same story, the public loses interest. But if I come here in 10 years and I'm telling you that we have made all these new discoveries, the interest of people keep up, right? So you need to keep going with the science. You, know, you need to keep doing the new discoveries because that's the only way that you can keep people engaged. So that's why I'm saying that you need to have both. Understood. In a way. Well, thank yep. you so much, awesome. Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.